నమస్కారం డాక్టర్ బిఆర్ అంబేద్కర్ సార్వత్రిక విశ్వవిద్యాలయం విద్యార్థిని విద్యార్థులకు స్వాగతం హలో వ్యూవర్స్ వి విల్ డిస్కస్ వర్డ్ ఫార్మేషన్ టుడే Another term for this kind of study is morphology. Word formation deals with the principles that determine the construction of words in a language. Let us look at some of these principles with specific reference to English words. By the end of this lesson, some of the main concepts that you will become familiar with are word, word form, lexeme, aphex morpheme free form bound form there are also some processes that are important in word formation these are inflections derivations compounding of the main concepts let us begin with the word different languages have different word formation processes not all languages have exactly the same processes that we will be talking about today we will focus on english to the extent possible and also try and demonstrate how other languages are different from english the orthographic word is somewhat easily defined for english it is not so easily defined for other languages If you take the case of Sanskrit you will find that words are written together in Sanskrit and it is extremely difficult to identify by means of the orthographic method on the other hand there is another language called Amharic in which special word dividers are used when writing that language in that language identifying a word by means of orthography is very easy Let us take a language closer home Telugu Telugu varies in terms of the way in which it is written Sometimes there are spaces between words sometimes words are written together It is not like Amharic nor is it like Sanskrit It lies somewhere in between If you examine a page of telugu writing you will notice that it is difficult sometimes to find out what the different words are in some other cases the words are very distinct therefore across languages it is not easy to identify words by using the orthographic means which is why we try to define word through various different means at best we are able to give descriptions of a word we are not able to give precise definitions this does cause a problem in a subject like linguistics which we claim is a scientific study of a language when we have a scientific study we should be able to give precise definitions but it is not always possible we therefore move on to doing whatever we can there are several definitions of the concept word let us look at some of them the first one is a meaningful item which when written or printed has spaces on either side this is the orthographic word that is it is an item that we can recognize as a word in writing The written or printed word seems to be easily defined. It is characterized by spaces on either side. In the sentence this is a book there are four words and there are spaces before and after each word. But take the case of the word school children. People tend to differ on whether it should be school children as you see there with space between school and children 
or school children with a hyphen between the two or school children without a space or without a hyphen. You are likely to find all versions when you come across this word. Thus, defining a word by means of spaces is difficult. A word can also be described as a sound or group of sounds that expresses a meaning and forms an independent unit of a language. If you take words like book, table, chair, you know what these mean. These are all groups of sounds that have meaning and form independent units in a language. But take the sentence, my book is on the chair. This is also a group of sounds and has a meaning, but we know that this is not one word, but a sentence. Similarly, in the same sentence, we have the word the. What is the meaning of this word? We know that it is a word, but it is difficult for us to give a precise meaning to it. We may then conclude this discussion on word by saying that a word is a group of sounds, it is a single independent unit, it carries a meaning, but more than all of this, a word is something we recognize by intuitive understanding. Let us move on to another of the main concepts. This is word form. Take the word brother. Take the word brothers. Are these items one word or two separate words? While we would agree that brother and brothers are two separate words, we also know that they are also one word. Brothers is merely a plural of brother. If we want to look up the word brothers in a dictionary, we will intuitively look up the word brother knowing that brothers will be a form of brother. Brothers therefore is just a slightly different form of brother. Similarly, take the following examples, carry, carries, carrying, and carried. We know that all the forms are essentially one word. They are different forms of the word carry. These variations are called word forms. Let us move to the concept of lexeme. The lexeme is an abstract entity of a word and word forms are the different physical realizations of a lexeme. Thus, if you have a lexeme, brother, the word forms of this lexeme are brother and brothers. If you have the lexeme carry, the word forms of this lexeme are carry, carries, carrying, carried. The convention is to write lexemes using capital letters. Now try doing some exercises based on what you have learned so far. Identify the lexemes and the word forms in the sentences given here. The papers are in the printer. The musician performed well. The colors are beautiful. Those boys are playing. Think about these sentences and identify the lexemes. We will give you the answers shortly. Now let us see if you have got the answers right. In the sentence, the papers are in the printer. The lexemes are paper, printer. The word forms are papers and printer. In the next sentence, the musician performed well. The lexemes are musician, perform, well. And the word forms in this sentence are musician, performed, well. In the sentence, the colors are beautiful. The lexemes are color, be, beautiful. The word forms are 
colors are beautiful. Remember that B and R are related verbs. In the sentence, those boys are playing, the lexemes are boy, the word forms are boys playing. Let us look at affixes. You will notice that S is added to the word brother to form brothers. ES is added to carry to form carries. ED is added to carry to form carried. And ING is added to carry to form carrying. You will be aware that these are suffixes in the language. Similarly, if you have the word unhappy, you know that un is attached to happy in order to form unhappy. And if you have the word incorrect, in is attached to form incorrect. Of affixes, we have suffixes which are those that attach at the end of a word. We also have prefixes those that attach at the beginning of a word. There are different types of affixes from the point of view of their function. These are inflectional affixes and derivational affixes. If you take brother and brothers, S in brothers is an inflectional affix. If you take the word brotherhood, hood is a derivational affix. The reason is that Brotherhood derives a different lexeme, whereas brothers only derives a word form of brother. So inflectional affixes therefore derive new word forms. Derivational affixes derive new lexemes. Inflectional affixes therefore derive new word forms. They bring about a grammatical change in the word to which they attach. Derivational affixes derive new lexemes. They bring about a substantial change in the word to which they attach by way of meaning. Some examples of inflectional affixes are play, plays, playing, played. Some examples of derivational affixes are player, playful, correction and rethink. As I said earlier, there are different types of word formations. English has prefixes and suffixes. Many languages have prefixes and suffixes, but there are some languages which have other processes as well. For example, some languages have infixes. An infix is an item that is inserted in the middle of a word. Since our languages also do not have infixes, the concept of infix is a little problematic for us Indians. Relative to Indian languages, inflections in English are much fewer in number. In fact, some people say that English is quite impoverished in terms of inflections. Again, Indian languages are very rich in inflections. Just take a verb in your own language and construct a long verb out of it you will find that a number of inflections are added on to the base word. In comparison, English has much fewer. Also, some inflections is fixed. You do not have innumerable number of inflections. Once you are familiar with the number of inflections that are given for a language, it is very easy for you to determine what an inflectional affix is. In the case of inflections, another aspect to be kept in mind is that inflections are attached to the main categories or parts of speech, that is nouns, verbs, adjectives and adverbs take inflections. Usually other parts of speech such as a preposition or a postposition or an article do not have inflections. In fact, this is true of all word formation. Word formation usually happens only with the main words or what we call content words, which are noun, verb, adjective and adverb. 
If you look at English, you find that there are inflections for nouns, there are inflections for verbs, for adjectives and for adverbs. Examples of inflections for nouns and verbs. An example of an inflection for adjectives would be something like few, fewer and fewest. I am sure you have all learned the comparative and the superlative degrees of adjectives. When we talk about comparative and superlative degrees of adjectives, we are talking about the inflections that are attached to adjectives. It so happens that adverbs also take exactly the same inflections. An example would be fast. Fast, faster, fastest is an example of inflectional affixes being attached to an adverb. But do remember that the number of adverbs to which inflections attached is very, very small. Every language extends its vocabulary by adding new words. These new words are constructed by using derivational affixes and also compounding. New words are always added to the stock of the content words that is nouns, verbs, adjectives and adverbs. And this happens by constructing new lexemes. We have already seen that derivations construct new lexemes, so does compounding. Indian languages are very rich in compounding. They have derivations as well. However, the number of new words constructed by means of compounding is much greater in Indian languages than in English. Let us look at the concept morpheme. If you take the set brother, brothers, brotherhood, you find that you can split them up as brother, s and hood. You cannot split up brother into further smaller parts. Thus, these are the minimal units that you get in these words. A morpheme therefore may be defined as a minimal meaningful unit in a language. On the basis of what you have learned so far, Try another exercise now. In this exercise, you should identify the affixes in the given words and also determine whether these affixes are inflectional or derivational. The words for you to work on are motherly, chairs, endear, rewrite, examination. You will get the answers shortly. Now let us look at the answers. Motherly has the suffix li, which is a derivational suffix. Chairs has the suffix s, which is an inflectional suffix. Endear has a derivational prefix. Rewrite has a derivational prefix. Examination has a derivational suffix. We know that a morpheme is the minimal meaningful unit just as a lexeme is an abstract entity and has word forms, the morpheme is also an abstract entity and is realized in the language as morphs. Some examples are given here. If you have the morpheme with the meaning negative, then the morphs for this morpheme could be un or in. For the meaning able, the morph is able. For the meaning play, the morph is play. If you want to express the meaning of having a quality, then the morph used is full. Notice that un, in and full are affixes, while able and play are words. Sometimes morpheme and morph match perfectly as in the example play. The words bank with different meanings, that is, as in the place where we deposit money and as the bank which is near the river are two different words in the language. But both have the same realization in the form of one morph. Let us move now to another concept called allomorphy. Look at the examples of a morpheme and a morph 
that is the morpheme past has a morph ed. In words like miss, call, greet, we attach ed and construct the past tense forms as missed, called, greeted. However, the actual pronunciation of the morph s differs in the words given here. The pronunciation is determined by the last sound in the word. Voiceless sounds take t, which is also voiceless. So, as s end, which is a voiceless sound, and therefore the pronunciation of the morpheme is t. Similarly, voice sounds d, which is so voice. So, take the example call. L at the end of call is a voice sound. Called has d at the end. With the sounds t and d, id is used. That is, if you have a word eat which ends with the sound t, the past tense morph is realized as greeted. Allomorphy, therefore, is the process by which the morph of the same morpheme is realized differently in different contexts. This is an example of phonologically conditioned allomorphy. In some unpredictable cases, the expected morpheme or morph does not appear. The past tense morpheme ed is not seen in the past tense forms given here. That is, write has the past tense form wrote and not the expected righted. Similarly, dig has dug and not digged. Make is made and not maked. These forms we are taught are exceptions. In such cases, we call these grammatically conditioned allomorphy. Here, there is no way in which we can predict what the past tense form will be. Now, try yet another exercise. Identify the allomorphs in the words given here and state whether they are phonologically conditioned or grammatically conditioned. Creep, crept, look, looked, hate, hated, cat, caught. Now let us see if you have got the answers right. Crept is a grammatically conditioned allomorph. Looked has t, which is phonologically conditioned. K in look is a voiceless sound. Therefore, it takes t. In hated, the final sound is t. Therefore, the past tense morpheme is realized as id. This is a case of phonologically conditioned allomorphy. Proved has d because v at the end of prove is a voiced sound and this is also phonologically conditioned. Caught is completely different from catch and there is no way in which we can predict the past tense form caught. Caught, grammatically conditioned allomorphy. Let us now look at some more of the main concepts a free form and a bound form. You may have noticed that there are different kinds of morphemes. Free forms function as independent words in the language. Bound morphemes must attach to another morpheme. Thus, brother is a free morpheme. And S and hood are bound morphemes. You notice, therefore, that free forms are words or lexemes. Bound forms are affixes. But do remember that all words are not free forms. All lexemes are not free forms. If an item is a free form, then it is going to be a word. We mentioned that there are three processes. We have looked at inflections, we have looked at derivations, and the final process is compounding. Compounding is the process by which two or more words are put together to form one word. Some examples are blackboard, greenhouse, tablecloth, dining table, history teacher. Let us look at these examples again. 
you notice that dining is composed of dine and ing. Teacher is composed of teach and er. Despite this, we call dining a word and teacher a word. Table, history are all words. A compound consists of words. These words may be free morphemes or they may be a combination of a free morpheme and a bound morpheme. Let us now look at the relationships between the different processes. Inflections form word forms. Derivations form lexemes. Compounding also forms lexemes. Free morphemes are words and bound morphemes are affixes. Affixes are of two types, inflectional and derivational affixes. Word formation happens when inflectional or derivational affixes attach to morphemes or words. Word formation is also possible through compounding. Compounding is the combination of two or more words to form one word. The stock of a language increases by means of word formation. Words are constantly changing and new words are constantly being constructed. Every time a new phenomenon happens in the world, there is an influx of new words. The two world wars, for example, brought in several words into English. Recently, the computer boom has also brought in several words into English. Besides all of this, languages borrow extensively from other languages. We either borrow a word completely or we borrow some parts of the word with changed meanings. Sometimes inflections or derivations are taken from another language and combined with the words within a particular language. This also contributes to new words in a language. Words are always changing. New words are all the time being constructed and this is part of this study called word formation. Ye Vunata Vijay Karakramalapai, me Sande Halu, Salahalu, Suchalu, Pampichavasna Machirnama, Director, Audio Visual Production and Research Center, Dr. B. R. Ambedkar Open University, Professor G. Ram Reddy Mark, Road number forty six. Jubilee Hills, Hyderabad, 500033. When we observe the literature of different nations, we see that apart from the contemporary topics, most of the important writers of all religions and nations, they talk about two things, that is the problem of birth and death and what is there beyond death, that is immortality. And depending on one's religion and faith, different writers come up with different conclusions. So you see elegies written by writers when they are near and dear die. There is so much philosophy, introspection and speculation going into this problem of death and immortality which is the unsolved puzzle because even till day, till date we do not know what happens, why a person dies, when he dies, what happens to that so called life within, where it goes. So this is a constant problem which teases humanity and which is a constant source of inspiration for many writers. So it is the unending source for literature and philosophy. 
And if we look into the literature of England or English, you see that there are many writers, Shakespeare for example, you have read the sonnets of Shakespeare and there he challenges death, he challenges time in his sonnets and in his famous play Hamlet, he has the question to be or not to be, what is the meaning of to be or not to be, whether to live or die and what happens when one dies, to die, to sleep, to sleep is perchance to dream. Hey, there's the rub, for in that sleep of death and dreams, what dreams may come, when we have shuffled off this mortal coil, must give us pause. So he says, if death and sleep are one, there are many dreams we get when we sleep. And what are the dreams we are going to get after we die, if it is a prolonged sleep? Is it going to be pleasant? So these are the questions which tease and which make us think what life beyond death would be if Hamlet himself has such problems. There is a contemporary of Shakespeare, the metaphysical poet John Donne. He challenges death because he has faith in the life beyond. So he personifies death, calls death by his name, death be not proud, do not think you can conquer me. So he writes a poem, death be not proud. Though some have called thee mighty and dreadful, but that is not the truth. For those whom thou thinkest thou dost overthrow, die not. And similarly, there is nothing you can do to me. So, depending on his faith, John Donne says that death is nothing but a mediator between this life and the life after. And there are other writers in your American literature, Walt Whitman for example, in his poetry he calls death by so many beautiful names. He eulogizes death and he says that is the most beautiful word, death, 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 death. And he calls it the word final, superior to all because all experiences in life and the progress of life, the journey of life leads to that final goal. And he says it is stronger and more delicious than any. He calls her lovely and soothing death. You have read Leaves of Grass out to the cradle endlessly rocking and for the other poem the elegy lilacs last in the dooryard bloomed here he calls death as the sweet mother the dark mother and the strong deliverers so these are the opinions of walt whitman who is also a transcendentalist and when we come to another american poet wallace stevens he calls death as the mother of beauty death is the mother of beauty hence from her alone shall come fulfillment to our dreams and desires. So, whether it is the 16th century writer or a 20th century poet, all of them talk of one thing, death and depending on their understanding of life, they give an interpretation to death. And when it comes to the post-war writers, because they do not believe in immortality, because they think that there is no religion, no God, their poetry is full of disappointment and disillusionment. Today now, we are going to talk how Emily Dickinson, a transcendentalist, an 18th century writer wrote about death and immortality and how her writings are special. Emily Dickinson, she lived for a short period from 1830 to 1886 and you know she led the life of a recluse. She remained alone and she is a hermit by deliberate and conscious choice. She decided to lead such a life and this life gave her a better opportunity for introspection and this is one of the qualities which you see all the writings are based on her experiences of the outside world or her experiences on abstract ideas like death and immortality. I use the word experience. You may wonder how a person alive can experience death because in Emily Dickinson, like in John Donne, there is no difference between thought and emotion according to some of the important critics. She has fused thought and emotion and whatever she thinks is close to her personal experience. She is a writer of special qualities because she never came out of her house for the last 30 years of her life and most of the poems which she wrote, she 
wrote from this home. This is Miss Emily Dickinson's home in Amherst, Massachusetts, United States. And in this home, which was her residence all through her life, she spent her life sitting near a window and observing the world outside like a pageant. And in the walk she had, observing nature, observing everybody. And from her letters and her poems, she wrote a number of poems. We know what kind of a person she is and why she is called to be a perfect flower of American transcendentalism. The perfect flower of American transcendentalism or New England transcendentalism because she had the qualities of both the Puritan thought or faith in God and at the same time the ability to think freely which is a quality of the transcendentalist. She transcended the qualities of Puritanism you can say because her concept of God is somehow different from the Puritan faith where God is a disciplinarian and a dictator. She refused such a concept of God and because she believed in immortality and in the Bible her most of her poems which she wrote in her solitude and were published after her death show how this was a constant topic in all her poems. So, she wrote about 1775 poems on various themes, but of all the themes, the theme of death, immortality, heaven, God or life beyond, call it whatever, this was something which inspired her and made her poems the most lyrical. So, death and immortality are the main subjects of her poetry and today we are going to see how she is very special in writing about these. In one of her letters to her friends, she says that bareheaded life under grass worries one like a wasp. What is the meaning of worrying somebody like a wasp? Means it goes on haunting you, means you can never forget that death is inevitable and that everyone who is born, everyone who is a mortal has to die someday. It worries you like a wasp, she writes to her friend and it really did worry her. Most of us may forget that we are all going to die, but here is a writer who has not forgotten that death is inevitable and her concept of death is somehow different from John Dunn's and the questioning of Hamlet or Shakespeare or other writers. She feels that there is nothing to be worried about death and her poems show that quality. Her poems show a perfect fusion of sensibility and thought because as I said she experiences death while she is alive. She tries to imagine the process of dying, what life would be beyond. So, she is a graveyard poet. She writes constantly of death and the beyond. She has a morbid concern for her personal revelation. So, most of her poems they are in the first person. She talks in by calling I, I am dying, I am going to the graveyard, death is my companion. So, there is a personal revelation in all her poems and what does she do? She writes in a dramatic way like the metaphysical poet John Donne once again because Alan Tate, he sees a similarity between Emily Dickinson and John Donne. Most of the, both these writers, they have the ability to fuse thought and experience. We generally think with our mind and feel with our heart, but for her there is no such distinction. She thinks and feels simultaneously. So, it is difficult for us to see where her thought ends and where her feeling begins and she writes dramatically with live locutions. So, she talks directly to us, either it is the description of death or nature, whatever it is she talks to the readers. So, what all she has not done in her real life by remaining a recluse, remaining like a hermit, she satisfies by talking directly to us the voice speaks to us, it is not a soliloquy or a person talking to herself, it is a person addressing the readers of generations. That is what Macley says when he says, she speaks to the readers of the things which every living creature knows and the voice is very clear and you cannot escape or you cannot ignore the voice which addresses us and talks of most of the problems which all of us face in our day to day life along with the fear of death which is always lurking and as more and more people in our contemporary society face any problems immediately we ourselves also question ourselves what is this death is it a pleasant thing or is it an unpleasant one and her experience and observation of life and death 
is going to be one of the topics. Her ideas on death, her faith in immortality, her concept of God and her description of heaven. I am limiting this lecture to these few points on death because of the 1775 poems she has written almost 50 percent of the poems on these topics and to get a clear picture of what she talks of death the kind of vocabulary she has used you have to read the poems of Emily Dickinson to appreciate her ability to bring distinct ideas abstract ideas into concrete observation by using far related images to bring the idea close to us. So, let us see what she talks of death experience and observation of death I am telling you an experience because you are going to see here this is the real grave of the poet after she dies and into this grave she has gone a number of times before really entering it. In this poem she says the sun kept setting setting still so life goes on my feet kept drowsing drowsing still. So, as life depart from the body what would be the response of the person as each and every organ stops its sensation getting more and more numb she describes here and then finally she says it is dying I am doing. So, she says this process which I am now describing is the process of dying, but I am not afraid to know dying. So, she says she knows what dying is and she declares that she is not afraid to die and along with this poem I would like to remind you of the famous poem which is already there prescribed in your syllabus because I could not stop for death and in this poem she very happily describes the journey of a person to the cemetery and says life does not end there the heads of the horses the chariot is directed to eternity and that she knew it after going there and death is a chivalrous gentleman who accompanies her while she is going into the eternal life of immortality. So, if the word great means anything in poetry this poem is one of the greatest in the English language along according to Alan Tate. He says that she has done a wonderful job by synchronizing and bringing together many of the images of life with the co concept of death and there is another critic who praises this poem let us see what he says it is a poem of departure from life an intensely conscious leave taking means she is very conscious of what she is leaving behind you see her describing the childhood in the school the middle age the old age all these they are not described in detail she gives us just some suggestions through the images which come one after the other before she enters the symmetry and after this intensely conscious leave taking she gives she ends the poem without a final statement on what is beyond according to Winters who is another important critic on Emily Dickinson. But these two poems are just samples of what she describes as her experience and observation of death because she not only described her own death she describes the death of her friend how she observes the change in the body the change in the behavior of the people around. So, her poems are full of this concept of death and now coming to the personality of death is she afraid of death does she think that death is a cruel man Shakespeare always uses the image of the skite and the cruel death the changes which are brought about in love and other things Keats and other romantics also talk of death as if it is bringing a disturbance into the happiness of life, but here she welcomes death and she writes that death is always very civil and gentle in his behavior and there is a beautiful full length poem on her description of death where she says death is the only thing you cannot find out all about because you do not know who his parents are, where he is, how he spent his childhood and she describes further the qualities of death she calls death industrious laconic punctual because he never misses his time and he is sedate he is very calm bold as a brigand because he knows what to rob from where and builds like a bird too he builds so many nests the nests which death builds are the graveyards he she compares these graveyards to rooms 
to nests and many such similar observations from her day to day life. And there is a final twist to this poem where she says after all this is done by death so carefully there is one thief who is that Christ, Christ robs the nest robin after robin smuggled to rest. So, while death does the industry or labor of taking everyone from life and preserving them like a, a bird in its nest, Christ robs each and every creature or each and every soul which is put to rest to the eternal kingdom. So, Christ is the robber who robs the nest into which death has brought each and every creature. So, the personality of death ha holds no fear for Emily Dickinson and there are some other points also which you should remember while appreciating her poem. Her faith in immortality is responsible for her fearlessness. It stems from her confidence that death is only a temporary door or a stopping phase from which one continues into the eternal life which is going to be very happy. So, she is confident like John Donne that death cannot be proud of his conquer. She says no rack can torture me, my soul is at liberty. She is confident that her soul cannot be held back by death. Behind this mortal bone there knits a bolder one. Such confidence in immortality is the reason why she welcomes death and constantly thinks of death because after this impermanent or mortal life she is going to go into a world of permanence and permanent joy. So, there is a poem which is prescribed to you also where she describes death uh, as a person who tries to hold back spirit. Death is a dialogue between the spirit and the dust and the spirit very boldly says that there is a higher responsibility for him and while death tries to hold back he leaves the mortal coil which is just made of clay and flies back to heaven. So, death is a temporary experience which can be enjoyed because it is not permanent and you go into the world of eternal life or immor immortality and her faith in God is behind this faith in immortality. Her concept of God differs from the Puritan concept, but you see why it is so. She says God, she addresses God in most of her poems as an earl a more a person who shows authority and in the poem on death she calls Christ as a robber who smuggles the souls to rest. He is a burglar, a banker who may maintains an account of what people have done because the Puritan concept is that God has to show mercy on you. The Calvinistic theory is that you cannot achieve immortality or salvation through what you do. It is God's mercy alone that does it and this is against her free thinking which says that depending on your reasoning, your logic you can transcend what these principles of Puritan faith tell in the Bible and she calls God somewhere as the father. So, depending on her mood she wrote a number of poems and I never spoke with God nor visited in heaven yet certain am I of the spot as if the checks were given. What are these checks? Checks means ticket, means your journey is almost confirmed, you have the ticket in your hand. So, she feels certain that there is a God in heaven who is going to receive her after death. Her faith in God is one thing and her mockery of the Puritan concept is another thing. She did not accept the concept of a Puritan God. So, she prefers the process of going to paradise in her own way to following the tenets of going to church, listening to the sermons and feeling that paradise is something where there is no change. So, in one of the poems prescribed to you also she says she prefers to stay on earth and enjoy her life, observe the birds and experience nature rather than go to church and listen to the dull sermons. So, this shows only her criticism of the Puritan concept, but not her faith in immortality or God. She objects to the Puritan concept. The maker's cordial visage, however good to see, is shunned. We must admit it like an adversity. So, in this poem, drowning, 
she says that God, we all respect God, but in case God were to come and appear before us, or if there is a chance for us to see God immediately, we would be afraid because he is a disciplinarian, he is a strict man and such God would be someone whom we would not like to see. So, her concept of God, her concept of immortality, her fear or fearlessness of death, everything you can see in the poems which she describes, though she has not talked to us directly, we can understand her concept of death and immortality by reading her poems and heaven is something she says which is unreachable, something which is to be imagined, an abstract idea, but once you realize an abstract idea, it becomes concrete and the joy, the thrill is lost. So, her concept of heaven is, it is something which is beyond reach and in some of her poems, she says the sweetness of the object of her desire increases in proportion to their remoteness. So, if you think that there is something very thrilling and wonderful, the attempts you make to reach it are very thrilling, but once you go, even if it were to be climbing Everest, you go and set foot on that mount, uh, that means it is already achieved and there should be something more thrilling to be achieved. That is the urge which drives man and she says that heaven is such an abstract idea and why all of us are thrilled because of it is because it is unreachable. Did the harebell lose her girdle to the lover bee? This is a beautiful poem in which she says, a maiden is attractive only as long as she maintains her chastity, just as a beautiful flower is attractive only as long as she does not give in to the temptation of offering itself to a lover bee. And similarly, heaven and God also are attractive only because we cannot understand them. Once they become clear, the thrill is lost. That is what she explains in this poem. It is a lengthy poem, so I have just given you the beginning quotation here. She says that heaven and God will lose their present status if understood clearly. So, something that is teasing, something which is beyond our reach is something which attracts us all the time. So, heaven is something unreachable and that is the reason why it is luring and puzzling and teasing. So, is death, so is heaven. Her poems are the distilled essence of her meditations because she has meditated, she has thought on these topics and whatever life nature and her observations have given her, she has distilled them. By distillation what you do is, you give the pure essence like a fragrance. So, all her poems are very brief in length, they are lyrical in their quality and they give you the extract or the essence of her observations on nature and through nature, through her observations about these concepts which she tells to the readers. And Many people consider to be her to be eccentric, they think that she is abnormal. There could be some reasons for her leading a life of a recluse, a hermit, not talking even to her friends, trying to even feed the birds by sending a basket with some bed, bread crumbs, but not coming down to feed them. So, she is eccentric, but her eccentricity, her loneliness and depression are revealed in her poetry not as personal experiences, but they are elevated to a subtler level where she gives her observations of real life and many of the concepts which all of us also feel that riddle us, that cause some problems to our understanding. And you see that all her poems are very brief, they are not, they do not run into pages, they stop short of a page or even less. The reason is, she concentrates, condenses the thought and makes them very brief. They are not grammatically correct, most of her poems and some critics feel that she does not know the rules of poetry, she does not know the rules of grammar, but that is not true. For when we read her letters, we see that she knows the rules of grammar perfectly well. In her poems, she intentionally changed the rules of syntax and grammar, defied the rules of writing poetry, just as she defied the rules of leading a life. So, she is a free thinker 
and a writer who experimented with grammar, syntax and vocabulary. She experimented with a number of words. When we look into the collection of her poems and her write, writings, we see that before choosing a particular word for a particular poem, she has experimented and seen how the word suits there. So, she is not a writer who just wrote offhand. She had all the time in the world to make the necessary changes and her poems show that whatever she has done, she has done it consciously. If we fail to understand the meaning, it only means that we should read it another time and yet another time. Her poems though short call for a number of readings before we understand them as she intended them for us to be read. So, condensation of thought and language, spontaneity and boldness of approach make the readers think. We have to think of the content, the style and her mastery of both the content and style in expressing these puzzling thoughts in such a beautiful way. Ma karikramalape, me suchanalu, salhalu, telijeti. Ma chirunama, director, audio visual production and research center, Dr. B. R. Ambedkar, Open University, Prof. G. Ram Redimark, road number 46, Jubilee Hills, Hyderabad, Aido Sunna Sunna. Sunna Modu Modu. <laughs>